Well, I hope everyone had a blessed Thanksgiving, whatever you did, wherever you were, who you were with, family and friends, and, and I hope it was a special time. One of the things that we've talked about often over the last few months with the lessons on identity and, and how we became who we are, the people that have influenced during our life and the experiences we've had, and certainly the holidays are an important part of that. And the idea of this spiritual practice of reflection, I've been doing a lot of that. I've been doing a lot of thinking about the important people in my life. When I say important, people that have influenced me. And, you know, certainly family has been a big part of that. Parents and grandparents and great-grandparents that I had the opportunity to get to know. Friends that I haven't seen in decades. Business associates that we became friends because of our relationships in business. And all of those things are so important. And we give thanks for that. And it's important that we stop and we take time. One of the things that uh, I've been thinking about, too, as I've been doing my reflecting and spending my quiet time, there was a baseball player, and some of you may have heard of him. If you're a fan of baseball, certainly if you were a Cincinnati Reds fan, you knew the name Joe Nuxall. Joe Nuxall was a pitcher for the Cincinnati Reds, a good pitcher for the Cincinnati Reds. He also became a broadcaster for the Reds, and during the, the heyday of the, the late 60s and early 70s, uh, he was very much involved with the team. And he was best known, and this is a little bit of trivia, he is the youngest player ever to play in a Major League Baseball game. In 1944, the Reds needed players, they needed pitchers. And he had the opportunity to go into a game, and he pitched two-thirds of an inning, two batters, and uh, he was 15 years old. Can you imagine that, a 15-year-old playing professional baseball? But one of the things that I've thought about him a lot, and I think about him as I do my reflecting, he had an expression when he got ready to wrap up his broadcast. Every game he said the same thing. He said, this is the old left-hander rounding third and heading for home. Well, I can tell you that my reflection time, my, the time that I've been thinking about the past, I'm definitely closer to home than third base. And I think I can say that about a lot of us, that we're definitely, we've rounded third and we're heading for home. And, and, and it does change your perspective. It changes the way you look at things, the way you look at the world, the way you look at your family, and the importance, the importance that everybody has, has had in your life. The, uh, the lesson today is going to come from Colossians, and it's the first of a series of, of lessons as we go through Advent. And I'm just going to read what the, the lesson writer says uh, unit 1 is titled, Compelled by Our Faith. It's faith. It's out of the quarterly, which is following Jesus. And it says, we will first focus on hope for the future, hope for something better, and hope for what God has in store for us. Then we will consider love, especially love of neighbor. How does God call us to love one another more, more fully, and how does God define love in the birth of God's Son? And then next, we will explore the joy that isn't defined by temporary happiness or emotion, but comes from the fulfillment of a promise. As we light the peace candle in the Advent wreath, we will consider what it means for us to confess Jesus as the Prince of Peace who came for all. And finally, with the Christ candle, we will celebrate the birth of our Savior, the Savior of all. The lesson today comes from Colossians 1, 15-23. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. I always have thought that the first Sunday in Advent is one of the most special times of year because it does give us an opportunity to reflect and, and to look forward with anticipation of, of Christ coming to earth. The um, one thing that I think about a lot, and as I was watching the news, I was watching the, the Thanksgiving travel, that all of the people were flying, millions of people were flying. <clears throat> and if you've ever flown before, it's always a hectic time. During the holidays, during the Thanksgiving holidays, people that, that fly, it's, a, it's an incredible experience. The hustle, the bustle, some people are satisfied, some are not, some are worried, some want more, but, but we all want to get where we're going. And that's the goal. That's all we want to do. We just want to get where we're going. And that experience reminds us that we live in a society that wants to jump right to the end. But when we think about jumping to the end, we, we, we want to do that. We, want, we get excited. We get wrapped up. Let's get to Christmas. Let's hurry up and get to Christmas. And yet it doesn't give us time to reflect and really think about the next few weeks as we journey through Advent. 
we want to get where we're going. And sometimes when we want to get where we're going, we get all wrapped up and we get frustrated and it becomes a time of, of anxiety. But yet that time of anxiety gives us an opportunity to prepare. It can create a time of depression. Even with Christians rushing, worrying, spending money, spending time, taking ourselves away from the anticipation of God's incarnation, which is this waiting period we call Advent. I'm going to go ahead and read from the lessons now. It comes from Colossians 1 and begins at verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the one who is first over all creation, because all things were created by Him, both in the heavens and on the earth, the things that are visible, and the things that are invisible, whether they are thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things, all things were created through Him and for him. He existed before all things, and all things are held together in him. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the one who is firstborn from among the dead, so that he might occupy the first place in everything. Because all the fullness of God was pleased to live in him, and he reconciled all things to himself through him, whether things on earth or in the heavens, he brought peace through the blood of his cross. Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies with him in your minds, which was shown by your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through death to present you before God as a people who are holy, faultless, and without blame. But you need to retain well-established and rooted in faith and not shift away from the hope given in the good news that you heard. This message has been preached throughout all creation under heaven. And I, Paul, became a servant of this good news. Think about the incarnation. Think about how incredible that is. Think about the God is going to come to earth. He's going to walk among us full of grace and truth. The incarnation is one of the two central doctrines which set us apart from other religions. Many others believe in infinite and transcendent gods. They believe that, that their God is the source of being and all its values. But the Christian doctrine, my friends, expresses a conviction of Christians that this God has made himself known full, specifically, and personally by coming to us as a particular man without ceasing to be the eternal and infinite God. God has revealed himself before through his works and deeds, but now we're going to see him in the flesh among us. The law was given by God to Moses, but grace and truth were recognized and realized through Jesus Christ. Now that was a concept that wasn't easily understood. We're going to talk a lot more about that in a lesson in a couple of weeks. That even the apostles didn't understand it at first. And it, and it is an important lesson. We'll be reading from John 14. But once the apostles had experienced the crucifixion and resurrection, they needed to tell the story. They needed to share the story. And that's what gave rise to the birth of the church, is that they needed to go out. When, when Christ was ascended, he left it up to them. He left it up to us. And so our lesson today is, is titled that it's grounding ourselves in a spirit of preparation for the coming of the Lord. And I think about that. I think about that a lot, and I hope you are too. We must not forget the humanity of Christ, the Lord, who is God. I mean, think about it. When I think about Jesus, when I think about Jesus as a carpenter, and we all know that. If we've ever been to Sunday school as a child, we hear about Jesus as a carpenter. I think about how he, he fell as a child and probably skinned his knee and it hurt. He probably, with his hammer, smashed his thumb once. And it had to hurt because he was fully human. And I think sometimes we don't think about that. We don't reflect on that. But he walked among us to show us what Christ on earth, what God on earth would be like. But then I also, and I think about this often, that one day in that carpenter shop, he looked in the mirror and he saw your face. He saw my eyes, your eyes. He saw your pain, your questions, our frustration. And he knew it was time to hang up his apron, walk out the door, and begin his ministry. Take time during the next few weeks to reflect and anticipate 
about the coming of God on earth, walking among us, full of grace and truth. There's a story that I think of, and I, and I share it every time I have the opportunity during the first week of Advent, during one of the first lessons of Advent. One of the things, and, and yesterday morning we got up and we watched the Thanksgiving Day Parade, and, and it used to be our habit that we would, we would have Thanksgiving with family, and then the next day we would get on a flight to New York City, to, to Manhattan. And we would have a car pick us up at LaGuardia and, and go into Midtown, and it, it's, it was beautiful. I haven't done it in years, but I, I remember the windows, I remember Rockefeller Center, I remember the Christmas tree, I remember how the stores were decorated, how festive it was. It was always cold. New York is cold this time as you're supposed to be. And, and one of the things that we always did, and, and any time that we're, we travel, we typically fly, try to find a church to go to on a Sunday when we're out of town. And our favorite church to go to was on Fifth Avenue, the Presbyterian Church on Fifth Avenue in Midtown. And I'll never forget a sermon that we heard. And it's like every good sermon, certain sermons you, you remember and there's just something about them and, and you think about it and you reflect on them. And this particular sermon was titled, The Angel with Buck Teeth. And I think about that. I think about that sermon in the summertime. And the story was there was a little girl in, in the Bronx named Annie. And Annie was, was an only child. She had a mother um, who would take in laundry from the neighbors to, to make a little bit of money. Her dad was a day laborer, meaning that every day he showed up at a particular place and then whatever jobs were available, he'd take one of those jobs and he would go to work during the day. And she got, as she got older, she was like a lot of children. And at about the time that she got into junior high school, she had these upper teeth that were protruding. They were big teeth. They were buck teeth. And she was very conscious about that. You know how children are, and she got made fun of. She got made fun of because she had big buck teeth. And, and it, was, it was embarrassing for her. And one day her dad announced that he was leaving and going to, he'd been offered a job in, a, in a, another community. And he was going to be going and taking that job, and he was going to get settled in. And once he got settled in and, and, he, and he got a place to live, he was going to call and have Annie and her mother come, and, and they would all live together. And he promised her, he said, I'm going to have a full-time job, and we're going to get those buck teeth taken care of. So the dad moved away, and, and days became weeks, weeks became months, and they never heard from him. And he didn't call and have them come to, to live with him. And then the worst thing in the world that could ever possibly happen, happened to the family. The mother developed cancer, and they didn't have money, they didn't have insurance, and she wasn't able to get proper care. And so the cancer started progressing, and she wasn't able to take in laundry and work anymore. So Annie was in school as a junior high student, and she began, when she got home from school at night, taking in laundry and doing it. She also got a job early in the morning working at, at a newspaper stand, helping fold newspapers that they would sell during the course of the day. And so she got up early in the morning, she went to that job, she went to school, and then she took in laundry in the evening. In the meantime, her, her mother's condition continued to worsen. Finally, it got to the point where the mother had to be admitted to the hospital. And so Annie worked that into her schedule. Every day she would go visit her mother. And I just can't imagine what that must have been like. And one day she was there visiting the mother and there was a minister who was visiting some of the folks in, in his church and, and he was coming down the hall. And he stopped in front of the room where Annie's mother was. And Annie was startled. She looked up and she saw him and she said, oh, oh, I'm sorry. He said, no, no child, it's okay. He said, as I was walking down the hall, I saw something. I saw something as clear as it could be. And she said, I know, I know. She said, I've got these buck teeth. And she said, but you've got to understand, my father's gone, and, and eventually he's going to get settled into his job. He's going to find a place for us to live, and, and, and he's going to call for us, and we're going to move back in with him, and he's going to take care of those teeth. And the minister said, no, child, don't be afraid. What I saw walking down the hall of this hospital was a light. And I stopped at this room where this light was coming from, and I looked, and there you were. There you were. You were holding your mother's hand, and then you took a, a, a wash rag, and dipped it into a, a basin of water, and you were you were rubbing it on her on her brow and and and, and touching her face. 
No, he said, what I saw, what I saw as sure as I've ever seen anything in my life is I saw the face of an angel. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. When I think about that story, I think about us. Each of us carries the love of God. Each of us has given an immeasurable amount of love that no matter how much we give away, he's going to give us more to give. And, and, and during this time of year, I was looking at the, all of the different organizations. They're asking for money, and they're asking for money to help people or to, to get together, to, to put together baskets or to take gifts or whatever. And all that's important. Don't get me wrong. All that is so important to do that. And if you have the opportunity, if you have the opportunity to share a monetary gift at a, at a favorite organization, at your church or whatever, do it. If you have the opportunity to get together and put together baskets or, or, or participate in some project, do it. But don't let that deter you from just doing the small things and sharing the love of Christ during this most important time of the year. It's who we are. It may be something as simple as when you see somebody and maybe you haven't seen them in a while. Maybe somebody you don't know at all. You're in line at the grocery store and somebody looks, they, they look nice, they're happy. They're, they've got children with them and the children are cute. The, the children are laughing and you compliment them. My, you have beautiful children. Gee, you, you're dressed nice today. You look nice. You look happy. That's all. That's all. You don't have to do more than that. If you want to do more than that, that's fine, but share the love that Christ has put in each and every one of us. It's so important. And it's probably the most important message we have as we look at this first Sunday of Advent. I can't tell you the number of people. It's been a rough year on our Sunday school class. We've lost many members of the class this year. And I can't help but think about the number of families, the number of, of men, number of women, number of, of, of children of, who have lost somebody in their family this year, and this will be the first Christmas that they won't have those people in their lives. And it hurts. It hurts. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with telling them that you understand. You can only appreciate how tough it's going to be on them and tell them you love them. It's important, my friends. It's who we are. It's who Christ made us. And the Word can become flesh and dwell among us. Will you pray with me, my friends? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for, for Advent. We give you thanks for you. It, it's just so important when we reflect on it. And sometimes we think that it's difficult. We think that we don't have the right words to say or the right thing that we should do. And all you're asking us to do is to share your love every single day with those that we meet. We share the love that we want shared with us. And so as we go throughout this week, keep our eyes open to the things you want us to see, our ears open to the things you want us to hear, and our hearts overflowing with that love that you have put in each and every one of us. In his name we pray. Amen. I love you, my friends, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.